Good evening. I don't know. I'm sure you can all hear me with this microphone, but <laughs> um, welcome. I'm starting to make a funny noise. Welcome to the Whalen Library for those of you in the room and to those of you joining us from home. Tonight, we're excited to have Whalen's own Joy Viola here to share her brand new memoir with us. Joy obtained a BA and an MA from the University of Minnesota School of Journalism. On graduating, she moved to Boston, where she began a 33-year career at Northeastern in a variety of writing capacities, including seven years as senior editor of the 10-volume International Encyclopedia of Higher Education. She met her chemistry professor husband, Alfred, at Northeastern, and together they began a lifelong hobby of international travel, nature photography, and birding. Sadly, Joy lost her husband in 2020 when he passed on from COVID-19. This book and this evening serve as a joyous tribute to Alfred to help preserve and share their stories with the world. I have a couple of Zoom housekeeping notes. First, we are recording this session for a broadcast on WCAM, our local cable access channel, and for the library's YouTube page. So you'll be able to watch and share this later. Uh, we are recording Joy and her slides on the computer, so the folks at home don't need to be worried about being recorded. Um, Joy will speak for about 40 minutes, I believe. Ooh, should I turn this off? <laughs> Maybe just down. Down. Okay, Joy will speak for about 40 minutes, and then we'll have time for Q&A. And if you're on the Zoom, feel free to put your questions into the chat, and I will read them aloud. So now that I've got that out of the way, we're ready to get started. We welcome Joy Viola. Well, good evening to those who are here and to those who are home. I don't blame you for staying home on a cold night. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how the book came about. As was mentioned, uh, Alfred passed on of COVID. He was in the nursing home. And uh, I was looking for things to sort of share with him. And I started reading our travel diaries from many years ago. And we were laughing over $2 for a state dinner and $8 for a motel and $1.80 to fill the gas tank. And uh, when he passed on, I began to think there's a lot of good stories here that perhaps could be shared. So that's what we're going to do. And hopefully. Uh, Alfred was born in Vienna. Uh, he was of Jewish background and he, when the Nazis came in in 1938, it wasn't safe for him and his family to stay around. So he was put on what's called the kinder transport, which were a series of trains that brought 10,000 German and Austrian children to England for placement in foster homes during the war. Uh, from there, he went to London and then to New York and ultimately to Baltimore. Uh, his father did make it to the United States. He was head of the foreign office of the Bank of Vienna and he wrote to his American client and got a visa to come. Uh, his mother died, his mother made it to England, his grandmother died in a concentration camp. Um, I had a very different background. Uh, I was a Midwest gal from Minnesota, but my parents moved to the state of Washington and we had a golden retriever kennel there, uh, as you can see here. Um, and I used to name all the puppies after kids in school, you know, who was the bully, who was the sweet one, who was the pretty one, and they all had names as far as I was concerned. Uh, Alfred came to Boston, to Northeastern University, uh, from Johns Hopkins University and the University of Maryland. I came from the University of Minnesota. And uh, I'm going to read uh, from the opening paragraph of the book. The name's Viola, Alfred Viola, he said with a teasingly James Bond style of voice. He stood as he introduced himself, bowing his head slightly in a European manner. He spoke with a slight accent. Little did I know I would marry this man within a year and spend the next half century traveling the world, 
doing wildlife photography, birding, leading safaris, and sharing all manner of adventures, both home and abroad. We were married in Old South Church uh, when that day there were police all over Copley Square and Al thought, what has Joy done? And Joy didn't do anything, but John Kennedy was going to speak at the Copley Hotel and there were police all over the South Station. Soon after we started heading west on camping trips and birding trips and uh, at one came, we came across this pretty bird called an American Avocet. Now, birders have what they call a life list, and this was a life bird for us. We'd never seen it before. Uh, we were on a side road in Nebraska, and the little bird was in the pond, and we got very excited and stopped the car, and Al jumped out with his camera, and I jumped out with the binoculars, and, and pretty soon a police car came up behind us, and he said, uh, is everything all right, ma'am? And I said, oh, yes, there's an avocet out there. And he looked at me and said, well, would you mind moving your car out of the middle of the road? <laughs> Birders do get excited about such things. Well, after years of camping, we got adventurous and signed up for a two-day pack horse trip in the Canadian Rockies in British Columbia to Mount Assiniboine Lodge, which was built in 1928 by the Canadian Pacific Railway. And for 50 years, it was run by this gentleman, Erling Strom, who was a crusty Norwegian uh, and a ski instructor. And again, I'll read from the book. We were driven 10 miles out of Banff in a Jeep and there introduced to Erling, where his crew of Swiss cowboys prepared to load up our gear. Our luggage was packed in duffel bags, as instructed, so we could easily go on the back of pack horses. But then there was the lawn chair. I'm supposed to pack a lawn chair on the back of a horse, Erling asked. Well, no, Erling, it's actually part of a photo blind. You see, there's a metal rim that goes across the top and a camouflage canvas. Well, I once had a lady who wanted to pack in eight rolls of toilet paper, but this takes the cake, he grumbled. He shook his head in bewilderment, but then instructed one of the cowboys to put the canvas webbed lawn chair on a pack horse. We rode all day and then bunked at a halfway house that night. The next day, July 4th, the pack horses were loaded once again and we started out. The trail took us over a pass and into a valley where we stopped for lunch. An outgoing pair of wranglers and pack horses told, told us that August Pass was still closed and we'd have to go across to Cinnaboyne. Well, the mount ladder had many snow slides and down trees were everywhere. The horses picked their way carefully around the trees and then the trail began to climb and we were traversing loose shale and steep mountain slope, which had me terrified. I'd like to get down and walk, I called to Erling. You sit there, he replied. Give the horse her rein. She knows what she's doing even if you don't. I sat there like a scolded puppy my head down as I gave my horse her reins. It made sense, the horse didn't want to fall down the mountainside and she'd done this before. At the top of the second pass, it began to snow lightly and then with more vigor. We headed back down, then climbed up again, and then looking up the mountain trail before me, I saw the Norwegian and Canadian flags flying. We'd made it. A Cinnaboyne Lodge is actually a, the, this area, uh, a UN UNESCO uh, site. And while we were there, it's called the Matterhorn of the Canadian Rockies. While we were there, we were thrilled that Tenzing Norgay, who was the Nepalese Sherpa for Sir Edmund Hillary's ascent of Mount Everest, came by to see Mount Assiniboine and we were able to have afternoon tea with him. He was a charming man. Well, from the Canadian Rockies, we journeyed to Trinidad and Tobago off the coast of Venezuela. And through a birding magazine, we'd learned that uh, the Acerite Nature Center in the rainforest of Trinidad was a naturalist mecca. And uh, getting there proved to be quite an adventure, especially when they turned off the terminal lights on us at Port of Spain Airport, and we were left standing there in the dark. You can read about what happened to us in the book. All eyes were on the forest canopy with people either looking with binoculars or taking pictures. And one of the uh, highlights of this area is seeing the oil birds. Even Teddy Roosevelt came to see them in 1917. They dwell in caves 
And they're called oil birds because they are very fat and the uh, indigenous people used to boil them down to get heating oil from them. Uh, the, they're only in Trinidad and Venezuela and Peru, so it was quite an experience to be able to see them. Well, our visit to Trinidad and Tobago gave me the title for chapter two of the book, A Banana Quit in the Lemonade and a Mott Mott in the Bedroom. If you go to uh, Trinidad and go to Tobago, you're told to go see Mrs. Ale Founder and visit her estate. This beautiful old plantation home, I'm reading from the book, had a unique open air architecture. There were no screens on the windows, so a bird flyby through the living room was not uncommon. Mrs. Ale Founder was a kind hearted, somewhat eccentric woman with white hair twisted into a single braid that held, fell down her back. And she had a high pitched voice with a very prominent upper crust English accent. Now, as you can see here, the entrance to her home was via a central set of 10 stairs, which then merged into a long double stairway, reminiscent of the old MGM musicals with Fred Astaire. But there were no chorus girls on these stairs, just large toads with the acrobatic ability to hop their way up the steps. And in the evening, the living room, dining room, became a ballroom for the toads, attracted by the insects, which were attracted by the lights. So after dinner, we had an amazing wildlife show. We had geckos darting in and out behind the picture frames on the walls. We had toads hopping around on the floors. We had wood rats scampering in the trees and ants on the large pillars. And when we were shown to the bedroom suite with dressing room and bath, we noted a mosquito net hung over each of the two beds and bird droppings on the floor between the beds. Oh, exclaimed Mrs. Ale Founder. You have to share the room with a what what? He roosts on the light cord. I thought, okay, this is going to be interesting. The mot mot is the blue bird up in the upper corner. He's about the size of a crow. He's very attractive. He was very quiet. He didn't snore. The yellow breasted bird is a banana quit. Uh, and they have a sweet tooth. And so they will, given a chance, stick their beak in your lemonade. These are the toads that came in groups up the stairs at night. And the last bird is a chachalaca, which is kind of a turkey sized bird. And it's rather something when he flies through the living room. <laughs> in 1986, we made our first safari to Africa and it would prove to be the first of seven. It's like potato chips, one is never enough. Chapter five details our first trip to Kenya. And this is the kind of vehicle that you normally traverse in with the rooftop that lifts up so you can stand up there with your camera. That is Mount Kilimanjaro in the background. Uh, one of the problems is tourists harassing the wildlife. And we got rather upset when we had five combis like this all around this cheetah mother with her cubs. She hadn't been able to feed them for three days. And you see cheetahs hunt during the day because of their speed. Lions, leopards hunt at night. Uh, and we were, we were yelling at people to back up. And so we were afraid she'd go off or kill it or her young ones wouldn't, wouldn't get to eat and hence survive. Well, everybody wants to see the big five. Lion, elephant, leopard, buffalo, rhino. I have a thing about lions. Uh, Sometimes they don't do anything, but I find it interesting just watching them. Uh, a pride of lions to me is a very beautiful thing. We took my nephew at one point uh, when he graduated from college over and the first night we went out on a night safari and he heard a lion roar. And he said, man, this is like being in the Discovery Channel. <laughs> Uh, you need to learn to read animal behavior. Uh, if you see elephants just drinking like this, that's fine. But if you see one with his ears flapping and he's trumpeting at you and he's making little mark charges, you need to be careful. He may just be a young male who's trying to uh, show off how macho he is, or he may be serious and doesn't like you there and wants to charge. One thing you don't do is turn off the engine in the combi when you see something like this. 
Uh, you look for lions in the grasses where they blend in. You look for leopards up in the tree where they blend in. Uh, one of the most dangerous are the buffalo because they're very unpredictable as far as their temperament is concerned. And there's more people that get killed by them. Now this rhino was in Meru National Park and because rhinos have been poached so much for their tusks, he was guarded 24 seven. It's a white rhino and white meaning, not that he's white colored, but he has a wide mouth. When we got back to Boston a week later, I read in the Globe, this rhino was killed and so were all five of the guards by poachers. There's only two white rhinos left in the wild now and their mother and daughter. So this is one of the problems. Well, sometimes you get a comic shot like three-headed giraffe. <laughs> and being birders, we were very pleased about the fact that there's over a thousand species of birds in Kenya. This is a saddle-billed stork who's quite a colorful fellow. Alfred had a sabbatical leave in Australia and he loved the country and the people so much we led a tour of 22 over there to Sydney and Melbourne and Brisbane and the Outback. And in the book, this chapter is entitled Kangaroos, Cockatoos and Chunk Chops. Uh, one of Australia's most famous landmarks is Ayers Rock. It's a sandstone monolith, which is sacred to the indigenous people, the Aborigines. Uh, the wildlife there includes uh, fairy penguins, which you can actually see down at the uh, aquarium in Boston. Uh, there's quite a story in the book about these little guys. I won't go into all of it, um, but they prompted the formation of what we call the Penguin Society. And from that first group that we led to Africa and then to Australia, there was a group that came and we ended up leading on a number of different tours to out of the way places. But the fairy penguins, gave birth to the Penguin Society. Uh, the charter was written up on the plane on the way back by two lawyers dedicated to travel to exotic lands while eating gourmet food. Um, these little fairy penguins also had us trying to sing O Canada one night, but I'll let you read about that in the book too. Now there are seven endemic mammals in Australia. The koala being one of them, 61,000 of these koalas died in the fires last year. And the kangaroos didn't do much better. There were 3 billion animals killed in those wildfires in 2020. Note the joey in the pocket of his mama here. Now, I mentioned behaviorisms. Well, this happens with birds too. Uh, this is a satin bowerbird and he's quite an interior decorator. He favors blue, no other colors. His bower is over there on the left uh, on the ground and he decorates the entrance to his bower with blue ballpoint pens, bottle caps, feathers, paper, anything he can find that's blue. Now, I thought I was gonna put this to the test. So you'll see in the foreground, there's something that's a bit yellow. I tore off a bit of a yellow plastic bag and put it there and he immediately went over and picked it up and threw it out. So I tried it a second time and he looked at me like, lady, I don't do yellow. And his, he's doing all this for the sake of the female who flies around and looks at all the bowers and decides which gentleman has the best sense of interior decorating and that's who she'll select for her mate. And you'll note in the back, you can see that bit of yellow that I put in that he was not gonna have any part of. Uh, there's much in the book about the cave uh, drawings depicting the uh, Aboriginal dream time, which is their version of creation. And uh, these cave drawings tell the stories of how everything on earth was created according to the Aboriginal dream time. It's, it's quite interesting. Well, another area for endemic species is the Galapagos Islands. They are volcanic in origin, uh, 19 of them, and uh, they were visited by Charles Darwin in 1835. And it was here, he was only 22 years old. He was just a young medical student 
when he came to the Galapagos. And he developed his theory of evolution. One of his theories were based on this bird. This is a ground finch. There's a small build ground finch, a medium build and a large build. They live on different islands and their food source is different. So he surmised that the shape of the bill evolved to accommodate the source of food available there. This is a flightless cormorant. Now you've heard the old adage, use it or lose it. Well, they haven't used their wings because the waters around are so rich with food for them, they have no reason to fly off. So in the course of many decades, their wings have atrophied and they can no longer fly. They are flightless cormorants. And this is dear old George. Now George was the last of the Pinto Island giant tortoise. And by the way, Galapagos is the Spanish word for tortoise. He died in 2012, the last of his species. And that being in part because in the 1800s, a lot of the pirate ships and other ships filled their holds with these tortoise who could go for as long as a year without eating or drinking. And they would then use the tortoise meat, but they practically wiped out the species. They tried to introduce George to a number of ladies, but he wasn't having any part of it. Um, they have in recent studies now from the Galapagos Research Center there, found by DNA, uh, some who are quite close to George's DNA, but um, he was the last of his species. He was over a hundred years old when he died. Now, if you were to sail south from the Galapagos to the tip of South America, and through the Drake Passage, you would come to Antarctica. This is the world's most pristine ecosystem and wilderness. It really makes you feel very small in the presence of this continent. Getting ashore is by zodiacs. Um, that's okay unless you're like me and you can't swim and you're afraid of the water. And so when I talk about uh, people going beyond their comfort zone, I was certainly beyond mine here. I stared at the floor until I got there, but I wanted to get to the shore because that was the only way I was gonna photograph the wildlife and this is what was waiting. 100,000 pairs of king penguins. The two little brown ones in the front are what they call oakum boys. Those are young ones who are just getting their first coat. And the interesting thing here is that the male and female can feed their young by the chick's voice. So if that chick is way up the mountainside squawking, his parent is going to know where to find him by his voice. And in the meantime, the parent has to go through all this mob of 100,000 penguins, all of whom are pecking because they're very territorial in order to get to his young. These are Gentoo penguins, and you see how they're being fed. That is krill that is being passed from the adult bird to the young. It's a small shrimp-like uh, fish. And both take care of the young. On the left, you'll see there's a tiny chick laying on his foot and being kept warm by the feathers over him. And on the right, the chick is clearly asking to be fed. Well, from the Antarctic, we go all the way up to the Arctic. And this was one of my favorite trips. People often ask which were your favorites. Well, I would say this was one of them. We were on tundra buggies 50 miles from Churchill on the shores of the Hudson Bay. Now with the tundra buggy, the lead vehicle you're seeing is what we went out on during the day. It's built on a school bus chassis. Those wheels, the windows are 10 feet off the ground. Uh, we each had our own seat on each side so we could move back and forth taking pictures of what? Polar bears. And then we had bunk beds in the little ones that you see with little small windows. There were 16 of us in each of those bunk cars. And then there was a lounge and a, a kitchen and eating area. Okay, so here's the hallway. Initially, we were all trying to get dressed inside our little area. We had a denim curtain and bunk beds and 
after a while, that sort of went by the wayside and everybody was just out in the hall. But this is where I lived. Um, I had a window, I had hung my things on little brackets. Uh, there was a ladder that was going up to the bunk over me. I had a little denim curtain. I could pull that there. And this is where I wrote my diaries on this trip because the book is based on my diaries. And what we were after were pictures of the polar bears. In fact, uh, if you look carefully at the one on the bottom, now that's 10 feet up to that platform. A polar bear can stand up to 12 feet high on his back legs and they can weigh a thousand pounds. They're looking to see if there's anything to be had to eat. We were told, don't you dare give anything or you literally get shipped off the island. They send you right back to Churchill because they do not want the bears to associate food with people. You begin to recognize the bears by marks on them, by scars on them. Uh, when I got home and looked at the pictures, I realized we had seen 44 different polar bears. I, some had feet like bedroom slipper feet. Others looked like they just came out of a, a manicure, had a pedicure. Some would have a scar on their nose. Some would have sort of a yellowish tint because they'd been rolling in sea oil. Uh, and, and as I looked at the pictures, I started naming them all, of course. And uh, this is Brutus. Well, I'm gonna read from the book here. November 23rd, today is Thanksgiving Day in the Arctic. This afternoon, we saw the biggest bear we've seen thus far. He was a colossal male. I named him Brownie because his feet and legs were brown. That's how I managed to distinguish between the different bears. They all had something distinctive, colorations or scars or bedroom slipper feet or manicured feet. When Brownie stood on his hind legs, he was probably 12 feet tall, weighed a thousand pounds. The bottom of the tundra buggy windows are 10 feet off the ground and Brownie's head was above that mark. November 25th, Cape Churchill. This is 50 miles from civilization. One of the bears ambled over to the side of the tundra buggy. So I decided to go to the back caboose, devoid of windows and meet him on the platform there. Okay, bear, I asked, are you ready for your close up? I established eye contact with him. He slowly sauntered over and then began to rise up on his back legs. I leaned over the edge of the platform, looking directly at his face and into his eyes, shooting frame after frame, and then I could no longer focus. He rose up higher and then higher, and then it happened. I'm not going to tell you what happened. You have to read the book. Meet Per Magnus. This is the polar bear with which I had quite an experience but we have to move along. The book also has a chapter on our trip to Cuba entitled Castro Hemingway and a 47 Packard. The island is beautiful. You always hear about the beaches, but the mountains, I, I was very surprised at the scenery there. We were uh, on a people to people tour when it was possible to go to Cuba in 2012. One of the things that are fun to see are the old vintage cars. They're all about 1960s Chevys and Fords and what have you. And they keep them running by switching parts from one car to another. But because of the embargo, they haven't been able to get any, any spare parts. The architecture is quite lovely where it's maintained. Unfortunately, most of the time it isn't. And Havana is very run down. Castro's influence is everywhere. Uh, we were supposed to be on a people-to-people -people program, natural history tour, supposedly, but the Cuban government had other ideas when we got there. And a lot of the sites we were supposed to see that were wildlife sanctuaries or what have you got eliminated because they wanted us to see a hospital or a museum or an art gallery or whatever. Uh, this is the little Cuban emerald hummingbird, which was one of the few birds that we did get to see as our itinerary was changed by what the government wanted to see. It's a complex story, but you can read that in the book too. And there's a chapter entitled Tigers, Trains, Cranes, and Hot Curries. And now this was about Alfred's fam trip to India. 
uh, a familiarization trip sponsored by the Indian government for American natural history tour leaders. And he went over with people from museums and uh, uh, the aquarium in Boston, people from around the country who led tours through international expeditions, which was the country that we used. Now, Alfred was not one to be poetic, but when he saw the Taj Mahal, he wrote, when we got our first glimpse of the Taj Mahal, I was astounded. The Taj is difficult to describe, it is so magnificent. It's built of white marble inlaid with 28 types of precious and semi-precious stones. Sapphire, jade, jasper, turquoise, and lapis lazuli, just a few. Of course, one of the other exciting things to see is a tiger. And he saw more than one and he wrote about his adventures. And when he got home with his recording, I had to transcribe it all <laughs> for the journal, but he was very good about keeping a journal. There is also a chapter about my solo trip to China with the Northeastern University delegation in the wake of ping pong diplomacy. Uh, I think you are all too young maybe to remember that our relations with China were established because of a ping pong game. And that story is in the book. Uh, my somewhat blonde hair at the time was fascinating to the men and women alike. Uh, this was 1981 and uh, everyone was in Mao suits and they hadn't seen many Western tourists. The women would come up and feel my hair to see what the texture was like. We were there to negotiate sister institution agreements for Northeastern. And I, I tell the story of Ambassador Wong Bing Nan and hosting him at Henderson House in Weston. And uh, well, there's, there's quite a bit to tell about China, but in any event, uh, I was then Dean of International Affairs to my side there is Kenneth Ryder, who was the president of Northeastern at the time and George Matthews, who was chairman of the board of trustees. And when President Ryder was speaking, you can see we had uh, Lennon, Marx, and Engel looking on. You may also note everybody's wearing their coats because there was no heat. And we were all holding on to those hot cups of tea to keep our hands warm because the buildings had no heat. Well, like the Taj, the Great Wall is another magnificent uh, sight to see. It's said to be the only man-made item you can see from outer space. It's over 13,000 miles long. And when you think it's 3,000 miles across the United States, that gives you some idea of how long the Great Wall is. And it's 3,000 years old. M much has changed in China since I visited there. And I talk about that in the chapter. Uh, Shenzhen, which we saw as a wide spot in the road which was going to be their first economic development area, now has 14 million people. It has 141 companies doing artificial intelligence. It has malls that make ours, put ours to shame. Uh, and they talk about becoming the world's largest economy. And when I see what they've done in 40 years, it's uh, rather sobering. Finally, the last chapter here in the international chapters concerns my very solo book research trip to Saudi Arabia. And someone had asked, was this the first book I wrote? No, it wasn't, it's the first interesting one. Mm -hmm. uh, the other was on Saudi Arabian manpower planning, which would bore you to death and put you to sleep unless you were interested in the topic. And the others were on college and university uh, presidential inaugurations, and that isn't very interesting either. But this one is different. Let me read from the opening paragraph from this chapter. It was April 25th and I was having lunch at the racetrack, the King Abdulaziz racetrack in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. I was a single American woman dining with seven Saudi sheiks in a socially segregated country. I looked at my luncheon companions and remarked, gentlemen, you make a pretty good looking reverse harem. <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> Later that week, I sat on a carpet covered lawn with a Saudi prince discussing Saudi manpower issues. I returned to the hotel at 3 a.m. What was I doing until 3 a.m. in the morning? Well, you're gonna have to read the book to find out about that too. But this old gal was having a good time. We didn't travel all the time, usually only once a year. 
but we were married 56 years, so there were a lot of trips. And the last chapter is entitled, Meanwhile, Back at the Ranch in Wayland, Massachusetts. And the sweetest part of the ranch for me is my golden retrievers. Uh, as I, you may recall that early picture, my parents had a golden retriever kennel in the 1940s and golden retrievers are just my breed. And the boy down here in the corner is Apollo. He's my current one. He was at a book launch last weekend and he was the only golden there and he thought it was wonderful. Everybody was feeding him ham and turkey and roast beef and petting him and he thought this was a great party. Uh, let me read from the book about how this got started. In 1980, friends invited us to come over and see their new golden puppy. It was a couple here in Wayland. She was adorable. And I told Al, you've never seen anything cuter than a litter of golden retriever puppies. So I prevailed upon him to stop at the breeder's home in Wayland. One look and I told Al, I want a puppy. But we can't have a puppy, we work, he said. But I want a puppy. What would we do with it all day? I want a puppy. After three days of this conversation, Al finally said, oh, go get your puppy. We named her Princess Dior. She's in the middle on the top row and called her Diora. One day in 1986, when Diora was six years old, I noticed a poster at Wayland Animal Clinic, which talked about an organization called Yankee Golden Retriever Rescue. Well, I spent the next 40 years working on behalf of Yankee Golden Retriever Rescue. My Goldens inspired me to raise the funds to buy and build Riverview, which is the headquarters, and it was the first breed-specific rescue shelter in the United States. I then went from here to raising money for 10 years for the Golden Retriever Foundation for canine cancer research and Golden Rescue assistance. Then I began to raise funds for a new organization, the Friends of Gisikin, which is a nonprofit honoring the history of the Golden and the Scottish Highlands. And I'm still doing that today. In fact, all of my royalties from the sale of the books are going to the Friends of Gusikin because we're trying to erect a stone marker there to say this is the birthplace. And we did create, had commissioned this bronze statue of a Golden. And I should explain the gentleman on the far left is Donald Frazier, the Frazier clan, who was the first William of Gisikin. Gisikin is Gaelic for the place of the furs. And that's his tartan. And he goes back to the 1500s with his people being on this land. The woman in blue was the president of the Golden Retriever Club of Scotland. The chieftain holding the puppy is the chief of the Marshbanks clan and Lord Tweedmouth, who bred the first golden in 1868, first litter of goldens, uh, was a Marshbank, so hence his clan, and you see me, and then the president of the Marshbank clan. The golden came from a cross with a Tweed water spaniel and a flat-coated retriever, and of course, they're loved the world over now. Well, when I'm not traveling or birding or looking after goldens, my next biggest hobby is gardening. And as I wrote in the book, a garden is a thing of beauty and a job forever. The other thing I love to do is to bake Viennese pastries. Uh, Alfred being Viennese, he was very appreciative of that. And we used to host Viennese nights. Uh, we'd have as many as 60 people coming and then everybody got calorie conscious. And I thought, I am not gonna do this if everybody takes one bite of a soccer tort and then that's it. But I did bake a soccer tort about a month ago for the Western Whalen Rotary Club, and it sold at auction for $90. So I was pretty happy about that. <laughs> now I mentioned the diaries. This is what my diaries look like. I type them, combine them. Um, I have handwritten diaries, of course. And when we're on a trip, I sometimes have had an 18 hour day, but I will still write every single night so that it is fresh and you get a sense of hopefully being there with me on the experience. Well, I thank you for hanging in until the very end, as this little koala is doing. Uh, the books are available at the depot and at the uh, Drumlin Farm Mass Audubon shop and on Amazon, and uh, I have supplies of them as well. Uh, and 
the royalties, as I mentioned, are going to charity. So thank you very much. And I'll be happy to take any questions if anyone has any. Uh, of course, I tend to write all the time when you have journalism degrees, you sort of take notes at everything. Uh, I took a Grub Street seminar on how to handle social media, which was a, <laughs> it was a brand new thing for me at my age. And uh, I had eight pages of handwritten notes by the time I got through. So writing has been my career, only because I couldn't stand to practice the piano. <laughs> I thought I was gonna be a concert pianist. I was studying the piano. I gave a concert when I was 15, but I was watching the clock because I was watching when my two hours of practice was up. And I thought, that's not the way to spend my life and I never get tired of writing. So in any event, thank you to the library. Thank you to Wakeham for being a part of this and letting me share it with the people who are at home and any others that may see it along the way. And uh, I'll take any questions if anybody has any. If are not- there, Are there any stories you left out that you wanted to include? Oh my goodness, yes. But that's why you have to buy the book. <laughs> There's a lot of stories in there. <laughs> There's a lot of stories. There's a lot of humor um, because I picked the 10 trips that I thought would be the most adventurous. Um, I looked at several of them. I looked at the one in Indonesia when we were sailing on a Dutch wooden sailing ship and uh, we were going to see Komodo dragons. And one night it was, we were awakened by Steve Cox of International Expeditions. And he said, Joy, Al, come up, you've got to get up here on the deck. And we looked, and I don't remember the name of it, it's like Hayakawa or something, but it was one of the comets. And we had horizon to horizon view because there were no lights on the sea. And I never saw anything so magnificent in my life. We all, and we got everybody up and we were all just standing there with our mouth and eat opened. But other than that and being chased by a Komodo dragon, I didn't find anything in the Indonesian trip I thought uh, would be worthy of sharing, whereas these other trips have a lot of special moments along the way. So I have a question about the, was it Riverview you mentioned? The, the what? The, the, uh, the, the, the golden retriever um, that you said you, it was the first um, Riverview. Uh, Riverview, was it? Mm -hmm. so where, where is that? Is that local? Country? It's in Hudson, Massachusetts. In Hudson. Yes. Okay. It's along the uh, Assabet River. Uh, you have to have an appointment to go out there. Right now, they've got hundreds of applicants waiting. Uh, one of the problems has been that uh, it's, it's a good problem in the sense that spay and neuter has, people have gotten educated to not buy dogs from puppy mills and pet shops. So they have been bringing them in from other countries, most notably Turkey, where the golden was very popular but they can buy one for $35 as a birthday present. And then when it's not a cute little puppy, they just put it out in the woods and there's a no euthanasia policy in Turkey. And so there's all these stray dogs and the shelters are taking bags of dog food out there. And uh, I had two Turkish dogs, including Apollo uh, who came over, but because of the CDC uh, edict that no animals could be brought in from any country that had rabies, they haven't been able to bring any in. And so there are dogs in shelters in Turkey for which Yankee Rescue was paying the boarding, oh, wow. waiting to bring them over here while families over here are waiting to adopt. But until that CDC regulation, and they are working on a lot of the rescues, there's a hundred golden retriever rescues in the country. Uh, so we we'll hope that that gets to change for the sake of the- So at the moment there are no dogs at that facility? Oh, there's dogs out there because they can have owners turn-ins or somebody is elderly and passed on and their dog comes to them, but they also have some that aren't pure goldens anymore either. Uh, so they're, there's quite a waiting list for dogs. Someone online is asking, is there any place you haven't visited that you would like to see? To see? Where would I like to see? I know where I wanna go back. Um, I haven't done a lot in Asia. 
Uh, we did. We were in Indonesia, and when I was dean of international affairs, I was in Asia, and I've been in China. But that, those were not wildlife tours, and uh, I'd love to be able to go to Japan. Uh, and I, I, uh, we we did the Indonesian islands, but I haven't done that. I haven't done as much for a birder. South America is great, but. Uh, it's not too good an idea to wander around the jungles of Colombia with binoculars. And uh, so we haven't, we've been to Venezuela and we've been to Ecuador and the Galapagos, Trinidad and Tobago, but there's a lot more I would love to do, but I am going to Costa Rica in January. Um, Alfred and I were there 10 years ago at the Sevegre Mountain Lodge, which is at 7,200 feet, which is higher than Mount Washington. So it's not gonna be a warm day on the beach there. We're gonna be in layers, but it's outstanding birding. And uh, so I am going back in January to Costa Rica. Yes. First of all, I, I just love this presentation. Um, and it gets my, my juices flowing in terms of where where to go, what to do, how to do it, you know, no matter what it is one is looking at. So a thought that comes to me a lot is we often think of people going to take these wonderful trips. Uh, you know, the trips are not simple and they're expensive, and so you often think it's people who've done their work and can afford to take these trips, whereas I'm thinking, how can we get uh, young people and, and younger young adults to go in, so that they develop a, a lot of sensitivity for uh -huh. naturalism and for ecology and for awareness of different uh, peoples of the world, you know, all the good things that happen as a result of, of these travels. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, is there some way that one can really use these travels, for example, find some way to coordinate with public school systems so the school can manage maybe every mm -hmm. five years or something mm -hmm. to send kids? You know, so that it's not just think that, that one doesn't just think of these trips as, oh, that's wonderful, but it's kind of a luxury. I yeah. want to see younger kids who ordinarily couldn't get to them. Well, and it doesn't have to be a luxury. Now, there are very luxurious accommodations. Let's let's take Africa, for example, for safaris. I wouldn't like staying in them because I don't feel like I'm in safari if I've got all the luxuries of the world around me. If I'm in a tent and I've got a hippo outside, then I feel like I'm in Africa and I'm seeing something and I'm observing behaviorisms. There are many different financial layers of making trips. Where there's a will, there's a way. And you don't need to feel that I've got to have $10,000 in order to be able to make a trip someplace. And let's start right here at home, which is what we did. We were camping every summer. We'd go out west into the Rockies, all the way from Arizona to British Columbia with a tent, with a tent trailer. And I had been birding since I was eight years old, but I introduced Al to birding. And uh, I'd say, let's start right here at home with an awareness of what our national parks, our national resources, our wildlife sanctuaries, what they offer us. You don't have to go to Kenya on your first trip or Antarctica or whatever. Uh, Let's start at home with an appreciation for what we've got. Let's go over to Herd Farm in Wayland and take a look at what we've got. We've got a lot of lovely conservation areas through the Sudbury Valley trustees. Let's learn to look, and I mean look. I don't mean just walk through. I mean, we would see people on safari who say, oh, I didn't see anything. Well, I thought, where were you looking? I mean, we were seeing all kinds of things, but you have to take time and stop and look and listen. And that can start right here at home. And then when you start to make a little bit more money as you're going, I mean, one of the things that helped us was that we were leading tours. And so one of us went free of charge if we had a group of a certain size, depending on where we were going. Otherwise on academic salaries, we would not have been doing all this kind of travel. Can I ask a question about 
Uh, Al had real problems with the food in India. It was too spicy for him. Uh, the rest of the times, no problems with food. Uh, we learned to be careful sometimes about uh, salads, fresh vegetables and salads. Uh, but when we were, I mean, if you were on the ship, I mean, that was great food, but we were on an expeditionary ship. If you go to Antarctica, don't go on one of these big cruise ships. Go on something smaller that has natural history guides with you and gives you lectures every night and so forth to get a better feel for it. Um, but we, we were fine. And, and of course, we were quite willing to try whatever the local food was. That's half the fun. And uh, many times when we were in Africa, um, I don't know what we were eating, but it was good. <laughs> of course, in, in Australia, they once fooled us. They gave us a nice soup, which seemed to have little nutty bits in it. It was tasty, cream soup. Well, it was toasted witchetty grubs. So we had witchetty grub soup. And they didn't tell us that until after we ate it. But it tasted good. And the locals eat it. And you see a lot is what's up here. And we were wide open to whatever we were going to be served. I did get very tired of boiled potatoes when we went up to uh, uh, Svalbard in Norway. It was fish and boiled potatoes every day. And I thought if I'd known this, I'd have brought a jar of chives and parsley flakes or something to spice it up a bit. But food was not a problem, except for Al in India. He just didn't like spicy food. Yes. Well, it is, but I hope you go over there with your mind open to learn about new cultures and experiences and uh, not try to haul your American culture with you but to open yourself up to the culture that you're in. And that was some of our greatest experiences. And uh, um, I mean, if you're going to take the attitude that you've got to carry your American baggage with you, you might as well stay home. You need to be, if you're gonna travel like this, you've gotta be open to what's to see, what's to learn, What's to hear? Why do people think as they do? I remember sitting in a bed and breakfast in Alaska, uh, talking with local Alaskans about uh, wolves in Alaska and shooting of wolves. And I certainly did not like the idea of them shooting from airplanes and so forth. But we, we talked with the local people about their issues. And uh, as I say, if you can't do that, you might as well stay home because you're going to miss the one of the greatest parts of a trip. And that's interacting with the local people, enjoying their food, learning about it, learning about their customs. And uh, I think your, your trip is enriched if you do open yourself up to that. And you lose a lot if you don't. Yes. So were your trips? Were they spontaneous or did you have an itinerary going in? We had an itinerary because you had to, you know, if you're particularly if you're leading a group of 12 or 16 or 22 people, um, the, we had an itinerary, but Al and I usually sat up, put up the itinerary uh, as to where we wanted to go. Al had been in Australia, so he knew what he wanted to do there. Um, we had been in Kenya by ourselves when it was new when we went to Botswana and Malawi and South Africa, but uh, we would do our homework ahead of time, depending on what we wanted to see. We always incorporated some birding sites because that was interesting to us. Um, <laughs> one of the members of the Northeastern Penguin Society said, people go to Alice Springs and I never knew anybody, they'd go to see the uh, uh, Doctors Without Borders, but I never knew of anybody going to the sewer works, but that's where Joy and Al took a bunch of birders. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so 
in Cuba, that was one of the problems because there was an announced itinerary and we were finding the natural history things were getting cut out all the time because they wanted to show us what the government wanted to show us. So that was a disappointment there. Um, but Al and I would always work out the itineraries ahead of time. And then we worked a lot with international expeditions. We worked with wilderness safaris here in Kachichuit uh, at Whale and Travel, uh, planning some of the trips. And then you, you also go by the recommendations. They may say, well, you could do this or you could do that. And we decide which sounded better for us personally or for the group we were leading. But spontaneity um, isn't that easy. Uh, unless you're totally by yourself with a private guide. And we did have an, a safari of that type with just Al and me uh, with a guide. But frankly, you get the better guides when you're with a group because they want the tips. And a group gives more money than just a couple with a guide. So it's little things like this that you learn about planning trips. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, you, you need to do your homework ahead of time. And sometimes there's spontaneity because I remember when we were in Alaska, we were on a ship that had only 80 passengers and the tide was right. So we went into this little inlet and we all got off the ship and we hiked up to a lake and back and the captain blew the horn and said, you got to come, the tide's changing. But we could do something spontaneous like that. Uh, and we certainly were spontaneous with the polar bears. I mean, we'd start out every morning and where we were going to go, we didn't know. And we got in blizzards. You'll read about that in the book too. Howling winds and blizzards and whiteout and we couldn't find our way back to the camp. And uh, that was half the fun. <laughs> yes. So I really love looking at the polar bears that you photographed, but in recent months or within the past year, if you're looking, it can be you know, time or, or economist or whatever uh, national or world publication, uh, there are pictures of really emaciated or starving mm -hmm. polar bears. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad for you all that you didn't get to see that on the trip. I don't think that you did. I don't no, some of it is a matter of where it is too. On the Hudson Bay, you've got a smaller body of water that freezes up and they can get out and hunt the seals sooner. If they're out at the open Pacific of the Alaska area, it's not freezing up and they're not able to get out and hunt seals. And yes, it, the global warming is a real issue as far as the polar bears are concerned. What's interesting is that they are sort of learning and sometimes to adapt uh, in between the time uh, that they come out from their hibernation in the spring before the seals and the water freezes and so forth in November, December, they eat seaweed. Now you gotta have a lot of seaweed and kelp and things like this to fill the belly of a thousand pound polar bear. Um, but there's been notice of the fact that they are changing their diets a bit, but it's still a, a, a big issue. Climate change is real and it is impacting. There's no question about that. Yeah. Well, it's fun sharing this with you. Folks and online want to know where they can buy the book. Uh, they at um, the Wayland Depot. It's also at uh, Mass Audubon at Drumlin Farm. And it's available at Amazon. And uh, we hope in the next few weeks, some other local bookstores, but right now it's, you can get it online uh, at Amazon or you can pick it up locally from the depot or Mass Audubon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.